Hey guys, I am back with episode 3 of my tribute to horror games, and today I'm going to be covering the 16-bit game consoles, Super Nintendo, Genesis, and also I'm going to include the Turbo Graphics and PC Engine in that. I hope you guys enjoy it. And as you can see, I'm not going to make the same mistake I did with the 8-bit games. Um, I am definitely going to include the uh, Castlevania series in the 16-bit consoles because there were some absolutely great games. First up is Super Castlevania 4 for the uh, Super uh, Nintendo. It was released in 91. Um, and at first, I really didn't care for this game much when I played it back in the day. But the more I've played it, the more I've uh, fallen in love with it. And I've got to say, it's probably one of my favorites now. Uh, you play as Belmont again. Some of the biggest things about this one uh, that's different from this one compared to the, some of the other ones is you can actually use your whip and sling it around in eight different directions. You can shoot it straight up. As well as um, if you hold the attack button and it goes limp. And then you can use the control pad and sling it around uh, to block projectiles. This is another game I have not completed. I hope someday to actually complete it. Uh, here it's pretty hard. Um, and if you want to see a really, really great um, uh, gameplay of this game, go to um, the, the Angry Video Game Nerds YouTube channel. Him and Mike Matei um, for the last two weeks have played this game uh, straight through, and it is actually a really cool uh, gameplay of this, uh, of this game. Next up is Castlevania Rondo of Blood for the PC Engine. This is definitely one of my favorites. Unfortunately, uh, it was originally only released in Japan, but more recently um, it was released on the Wii Virtual Console, and you could get it on the PSP um, Dracula X Chronicles as well and play it. Uh, as you can see, I'm playing it currently in an emulator. Um, unfortunately, like I said, I don't own it, um, and I hope someday to own it. It's just quite expensive, definitely over $100 uh, nowadays if you can find a copy. In Rondo of Blood, you play Richter Belmont, a direct descendant of Simon Belmont. Uh, in the game, you are on uh, the search for your beloved Annette, who was captured by one of um, Dracula's henchmen. One of my favorite things about Rondo of Blood is it was on a CD, so you get quite a few cutscenes and CD quality music, which is great. Oh, and did I mention the direct sequel to Rondo of Blood is, that's right, Symphony of Night, my favorite uh, Castlevania game of all time. Next up is Dracula X for the Super Nintendo. I am very privileged to own a copy of this. I probably found it back in the day um, at a flea market for 5 to $10. Uh, like I said, I'm very happy to own it. Um, this is kind of um, a re-release of Rondo of Blood. Um, the plot is similar, the graphics are similar, music's the same, but they have changed uh, some of the gameplay elements. They've redesigned some of the levels, so it's not exactly the same. Unfortunately, if you're looking to get this in your collection, it's well over $150 just for a loose cartridge. But just as of uh, this month, they did release um, Dracula X on the Wii U Virtual Console, which is pretty nice. And the final Castlevania game I'm going to show is Castlevania Bloodlines for the Sega Genesis slash Mega Drive. It was released in 1994, and as you can see, you could play as two different characters, John Morris or Eric Lacard. John uses the uh, legendary whip, and um, Eric uses a spear. Bloodlines has actually a pretty interesting story as well. Um, Elizabeth Bartley, um, the legendary vampire, which is also Dracula's niece, tries to bring about uh, the resurrection of Dracula, and it's Eric and John's job to stop her. One interesting note of Castlevania Bloodlines is you just don't play in Dracula's castle throughout the game. You actually um, go on quite a few levels to different places in Europe. And when the game was localized in Europe and Australia, it was actually censored quite a bit. The name uh, went from Bloodlines to uh, New Generation, and quite a bit of the blood was changed as well. Mm -hmm. 
Next up is one of my favorite Super Nintendo games, Super Ghouls and Ghosts. This is the uh, sequel to Ghosts and Goblins that originally came out on the arcade and quite a few other systems as well as the NES. And yeah, this game's just as hard as Ghosts and Goblins. It is really, really tough. You have to play it twice, uh, just like you do Ghosts and Goblins. I'm not sure if I'll ever be able to beat the game, but I absolutely love playing the game because it's just really cool. A couple of neat upgrades for Super Ghouls and Ghosts that were not in uh, the Ghosts and Goblins game is, number one, you can double jump, which comes in handy jumping over the tombstones, as well as you can upgrade your armor up to three times. The story for Super Ghouls and Ghosts is as follows. Um, again, you play author, and once again, you have to rescue the princess from demons. Uh, the main antagonist in the game is Lord Sar Sardius, um, and the reason he captured the princess is because of a goddess bracelet, which is the only um, uh, item that can defeat Sardius. Next up is the Splatterhouse series. There were three of them. The original one came out for the TurboGrafx system, and the other two came out for the Sega Genesis. Uh, these are side-scrolling beat-em-ups, um, which you play Rick, a um, character who wears the terror mask, and he is on a quest to save Jennifer, his girlfriend, from a grisly fate. One interesting note about the original TurboGrafx port for Splatterhouse is that there was a uh, parental advisory on uh, the game due to its violent nature as well as questionable enemies. Uh, it read, the horrifying theme of this game may be inappropriate for young children and cowards, which I think is pretty funny. Next up is Splatterhouse 2 for the Sega Genesis. It was released in 92, and this game takes place three months after uh, the original game for the Turbo Graphics. Uh, the Tura Mask has been uh, reformed, and it keeps appearing to Rick, telling him he needs to go back to the house and that his girlfriend Jennifer doesn't have to die. Uh, there's eight levels in the game. It's a lot like the first one. The graphics are a little bit better, sounds a little bit better. Um, and I always loved when you get the uh, pipe in this game and you actually uh, hit the creatures and they go up against the wall. I always thought that was actually a pretty cool effect. Unfortunately, I don't own uh, any three of these games. Uh, they are available on the Virtual Console, though, for the Wii. Um, I hope someday to own them. They are kind of pricey, but maybe I'll get lucky and uh, find them out in the wild. And the last Splatterhouse game to appear in this video, since there was one released in 2010, that'll come later down the road uh, when I do my videos, is Splatterhouse 3 for the Sega Genesis. It was released in 1993, and unlike the other Splatterhouse games, which were side-scrolling games, this is more of a non-linear exp uh, exploration game as you beat monsters uh, in each room, you can actually hit the start button to open up a map so you can actually see where you can go. There's also power-ups you can pick up, weapons you can pick up as well. The power-ups, after you get a few, you hit the A button and you kind of become a superhuman um, uh, and pretty much take down anything pretty quick. Splatterhouse 3 takes uh, place five years after the second one, where Jennifer and Rick get married and have a child named David. Um, he becomes successful on Wall Street and buys a mansion in Connecticut. Uh, they move there, but um, after a while, the mask starts calling him, and he has to don the mask once again to defeat the enemies inside his mansion. Another very, very cool aspect of this game is there's four possible endings. Uh, there is a very, very bad ending where both uh, Jennifer and David, his son, die. There's one where just Jennifer dies. There's one where just his son, David, dies. And there's a good ending where uh, he can save them both. How the game determines if you succeed or fail is, as you can see in the upper left-hand corner, there's a time limit. 
like on the first level, um, there is a boar worm that is inside of Jennifer, and if you don't get to the end and defeat the boar worm uh, before time runs out, it devours Jennifer. And the final game I'm going to include in Episode 3 is Warlock. Uh, the story is loosely based off the movie, and it is once every thousand years the sun and moon align together. When it happens, the evil one sends his only son, the Warlock, to Earth to gather um, ancient rune stones. And if they're assembled, they give like ultimate power, which uh, is able to undo the Earth's creation. And basically, a modern druid has to travel through time to defeat the evil Warlock. Warlock is a side-scrolling action-slash-platformer. Um, it's not too bad. At first, it got pretty positive reviews when it first came out, but more recently, a lot of uh, game critics have kind of panned it for bad game controls and gameplay. Alright guys, I know there are definitely more uh, horror-based games for the 16-bit consoles. Let me know down below what you would like me um, to uh, review in the, in the future. Um, thanks again guys for watching. Hopefully in the next few days I'll be uh, putting up a um, DOS based um, PC games um, of basically the horror genre. Thanks again guys for watching.